Today I'm looking at The Last World by Christoph Ransmeyer. This is an Austrian writer and this work is his second novel. Although it's the first work of his that I'd read, this book was published in 1988. It was originally translated from the German and it's a fairly short work at around 200 pages. Although this book is a very dense book. It took me a while to finish and it reads almost twice as long, uh, but I knew after reading the first couple chapters that this would be a book that I would enjoy because I really like that kind of beautifully written, dense, poetic prose. Uh, although it's very short on plot and characterization, which is fine by me, but as far as plot goes, this book concerns the poet Ovid and what happened to him at the end of his life. He was, uh, well, he's the author of the Metamorphoses and a much beloved poet in ancient Rome. Uh, but for some reason, he had gotten banished by the Emperor Augustus to a remote town called Tomi, <clears throat> which is over by the Black Sea. And historically, no one really knew why he was banished. And this book is an imagining of what took place and the, the last years of, of Ovid's life. The main character of this book is a young man named Coda who leaves Rome and goes in search of Ovid after hearing rumors that he had died recently. And he travels to, uh, to Tomi by way of bus, though it's a little odd. It's kind of an anachronism uh, because this book is supposed to take place in the within Ovid's timeline, but when he gets to Tomi, there's a lot of 20th century technology. Uh, the time seems to shift, and there's there's a lot of anachronisms like that. There's locomotives and buses, and a character that operates a movie projector, and you kind of get the sense. Well, Ransmeyer may be playing upon the metamorphoses or transformations uh, in a larger scale uh, between ancient Rome and the modern world, or uh, Tomi may represent the, the last world for Ovid as a world of imagination and creation. Another thing that, uh, that Ransmeyer does that's interesting in this work is he gives the townspeople of Tomi uh, the names of mythological and historical figures. For instance, Ovid's servant is named Pythagoras, and there's characters like Procne and Arachne, Tereus, uh, Jason, and his ship, the Argo. Just a recycling of mythological characters in this contemporary landscape. Uh, in the end, he even includes an Ovidian repertory, where on this side, it, he discusses the characters in this work and then their context within mythology or like you know, Ovid's mythology. And it, I think it's a, kind of a risky, risky technique to do this because when you graft on these names to contemporary characters, you're kind of imbuing them with uh, a lot of baggage. And for me, the... This strategy sort of worked, but I, th I felt it was a little heavy-handed. Uh, but I might play in more with uh, the idea of transformations. And there are actually literal transformations that occur, uh, well, in the mythological sense. There's characters that turn into stone. There's stones that turn into men and women. There's women that turn into birds. He writes in a very mythological way. He has this proclivity of using archetypal words such as mountain and sea and flesh and plants and animals. And I get the feeling that he is influenced by works such as Sir James Fraser's uh, The Golden Bough or maybe the work of Joseph Campbell, just very archetypal imagery but if you're writing in this elevated fashion, this mythological fashion, uh, it sort of puts you at a remove from the heart of the story. Uh, when you have a sentence like, 
the strange woman came down from the clouds. I mean, it sounds cool, but it doesn't really offer you anything, anything with real grab to it. Uh, I think the writer V.S. Nepal had mentioned that, uh, you know, if you point to a piece of furniture and call it a chair, well, you're not really saying anything if you, however, say that it is stained with wedding saffron, then the chair comes to life. And uh, Ransmeyer, I don't think it's out of laziness that he likes to write in this uh, mythological manner. I think it's what he enjoys, uh, and it's seductive to write this way, um, but I think it's very powerful, and powering his imagination forward is, is what I suspect. Um, what he does with this Ovidian repertory, uh, what kind of reminds me of another work, a uh, different approach though, it's The Centaur by John Updike, and uh, this is a fairly well-known work, uh, and a fairly straightforward story about father and son relationship, a very realistic, traditional story until you get to the very end, and this is what this book reminded me of. Uh, he, get, he puts in this mythological index, and it's a listing of a bunch of mythological characters with page numbers, suggesting that the, the contemporary characters uh, in the narrative are mapped onto mythological characters, that there is a deeper connection with mythology, and I thought this was handled very well. Uh, when you get to that section, you're just kind of like hit really hard by it. Um, Ransmeyer, you, you have to more buy into his entire conceit when you're reading this book. Another book that The Last World calls to mind is by another Austrian writer. Uh, this was earlier in the 20th century. Hermann Brock's The Death of Virgil. Virgil was a contemporary of Ovid's, maybe a little bit older. And this book also describes the poet coming to terms with uh, a change, the changing world and his uh, forecoming death. And this book was also very beautifully written, especially the, the first part of it, and also a very difficult work to, to consume, but very rewarding. This, these two books, I think, I think Ransmeyer's is uh, trying to have a dialogue With, uh, with the death of Virgil, but there, there's no doubt that Ransmeyer is a very ambitious writer. This work was published when he was in his early 30s, I believe, and it brings to mind another writer, uh, the American writer, William T. Volman, who was also very ambitious at an early age. Uh, in fact, Volman had reviewed Ransmeyer's first novel, which is about the uh, a failed Arctic expedition. It's called The Terrors of Darkness and Ice. And I think Volman, I think Volman liked the book, but he uh, criticized it a little bit because Ransmeyer didn't include um, anything too personal in his storytelling, which is something that Volman, of course, uh, does a lot of. But I wonder if Volman got influenced or had that book in mind when he was composing his own uh, novel about a failed Arctic expedition, which is The Rifles, volume six of his Seven Dreams series. But yeah, I guess if this book has an Achilles heel is uh, what appears to be a lack of compassion on the part of the human, the human aspect of this book, you wonder if Ransmeyer really feel sympathy for his characters uh, because he he gives them the same treatment as inanimate objects and you know plants and animals or the weather it's just all given the same weight there's not much dialogue in this book at all and you wonder if um, you wonder if he is just he doesn't have that in his skill set or if maybe it's a little bit beneath him to create real human dramas that examine different aspects of the human soul. And that really makes me wonder if you can be a world-class writer and, and not go there, not really 
inhabit the minds of all different types of characters in a, a way that connects with readers. Um, a writer like V.S. Nepal is able to do that, and you feel like Nepal is kind of a pessimist about humanity, but he does that so well. But what really drove me into finishing this book was just the beauty of its language. I think on page 61 there's the character Echo who describes a type of varnish which is used on an object to preserve it from rust or the uh, dangers of the external world. And that's the overall feeling I got from this book is that it's beautiful language uh, protects it, uh, makes it withstand scrutiny, makes it inscrutable, makes it impenetrable. And if one were to uh, try to dig deep enough to get at the heart of this book, you would only just find more beauty. And I wonder if this book was painstaking to write because it really, it really involved just pure imagination. Uh, on the part of Ransmeyer, and sometimes I think books that are difficult to read may also be difficult to compose, or maybe this is just the mode that Ransmeyer works in, and uh, I just need to read more of his work, I think, to, to really find out. In fact, after I read this book, I, I was thinking, hmm, what other books should I read next? And I did read a V.S. Nepal book, just, you know, I just felt... Uh, seduced into reading Gorillas by V.S. Nepal, which I may do a review on, but uh, after that book, I went ahead and picked up another Ransmeyer book, which is, this might be his third novel, uh, it's almost twice as long, and I just admitted that, yeah, I do like his writing, and I want to read more of it, and just getting into this book a little bit, uh, it seems like he loosened up a, a, just a little bit on his style and is making it slightly more accessible. Just the syntax uh, lends to a an easier storytelling feel, um, but there's not that much compromise with his, his uh, use of heightened language. But this book definitely is respectable in how uncompromising it is, uh, how dense it is, how hermetic it is. Uh, that's one thing. It's it's so dense that there's not much breathing room that the author affords. He has very tight control of the, uh, the set design, the cinematography, uh, what characters, interactions there are. But despite all that, this book was a memorable reading experience, and I suspect that I'll be dipping into it here and there just to replenish myself with its nourishing prose, and I definitely will be checking out more of this author's work. It's The Last World by Christoph Ransmeyer.